Lovely. And thank you, Dennis. Uh, thank you so much um, for your briefing for this event, for pulling this event together and um, uh, for inviting me to share and to speak. Um, in a moment, we'll dive into all of that. I just want to extend my thank you to members of your team, uh, notably Roshan, who's working uh, feverishly in the background there to make sure everything is smooth and running slick. Well done, Roshan. Uh, and indeed, to everyone that's here at this conference, Success Talks, Accelerate Your Career, sponsored by BMO Capital Markets. Thank you for being here. We know how busy it is, don't we? And you've made a decision, you've made a choice to be here. You're here on purpose and with a purpose. And so I pray, uh, I happen to walk in faith, but I pray that it uh, lands in a good place and that you find the sessions over the next two days edifying and of deep value. As Dennis says, my name is Rob, uh, Rob Neal. And um, uh, what I share today is a deeply personal view. Um, I've actually played around with the words uh, that I was commissioned to speak to. Uh, Dennis is probably getting nervous now as I say that. But don't worry, don't worry, because all I've done is I've swapped them around. Uh, instead of meritocracy myth, I'm going to call this shearing over the next 20 minutes or so the myth of meritocracy, the myth of meritocracy. And so, as I say, what I share today is a deeply personal view. It's one born out of my 37 years, seven months and three days uh, career as a, a former civil servant, working, working at the heart of Whitehall, that machine that is there that uh, delivers the civil service as we know it. And for today, I especially draw on my last 20 years working in equalities. Yeah, I've spent more than half of my public sector career working in what's now called ED and I, equality, diversity and inclusion, with human resources as my professional anchor. I now run my own consultancy and as the director of Crystal Alliance, we work with organisations across all sectors, public, private and the voluntary sector, helping them, supporting them to become more inclusive. Now, as I say, what follows is a view rooted in my own personal experience, my own limitations and my own ever expanding and colourfully talented mind. I share no prescription today, colleagues. What comes next is not a pronunciation, nor a proclamation. It's merely a perspective, a perspective shaped by my insatiable and active appetite to study commensurate with my ambition to support organisations in becoming more inclusive. And so with that heartfelt disclaimer out there, allow me this. Deep down, you know, I think we all want to believe that fairness works. <laughs> Um, don't get me twisted. Uh, we are all old enough, smart enough, experienced enough, even the youngest amongst us, to remember that age is no guarantee of wisdom. But we are all savvy enough to know that fair ain't always in play. We know, don't we, that sometimes the rules serve only as a guide to what is supposed to happen. Now, the one thing we know for sure about meritocracy is that it relies upon the fair application of rules. Indeed, it depends upon it. And so my first piece of advice is this. Meritocracy is a romantic myth. Get over it and get on because you can. OK. I'm glad we've got the gushy stuff out of the way early, because next I want us to consider that it's OK to seek validation and specifically to invite an accurate assessment of your own performance, your own ability and for the more progressive workplaces, even your potential. You see, that said, my second bit of advice is this. Manage your need for validation and never confuse it for a determinant or indeed an indicator of your value or worth. I want to say that again. 
manage your need for validation, but never confuse it for a determinant or an indicator of your value or worth. That is very different. Remember, many of us and many of the processes in our workplaces were not designed to identify diverse, innovative, or indeed different talent. In my experience, most of the psychometric tests, assessment centers, interview panels, certainly the ones that I've participated in, both as an assessor and a delegate candidate, have been constructed along traditional and narrow norms, narrow ways of thinking. You see, validation is very rarely neutral, never mind meritocratic. Try not to invest your time in seeking it. You are good enough. Just do your thing. Finally, stand in your power. Play your song and know that your hire can save the organization money. What am I referring to? Well, you offer culture ad. It's culture ad way beyond any culture fit. And a growing number of organizations are starting to realize that. You see, the war on talent has encouraged recruiters to look in fresh places and in fresh ways. You fit that requirement. And so my third and final tip. It's this. Have your A game ready and be prepared to make those moves because the dance floor just got bigger. Now, again, don't get me twisted. That doesn't mean we won't be confronted by difficult and challenging conversations. Oh, yes. I sense we can all remember that sometimes dance floors can be crowded uh, and you might have to wait a bit in position until your track or your favorite tune comes along and then you can bust some shapes you can you can be ready for that moment and you can bring and deliver i guess a part of what my analogy is attempting to illustrate is that the isms and schisms constructed over centuries will not be deconstructed overnight some of you will continue to be regarded and referenced by traditional leaders, many of whom already in privileged position. And yes, in some cases, that will leave many of you wrestling with white privilege and indeed white fragility. Nothing new there then. And I am sorry about that. But the potential good news is this, and it's this that rests on my heart. Having let go of my beloved civil service after 37 years, seven months and three days, and stepped into this brand new space with my own consultancy, Crystal Alliance, of which I'm now a director, it has afforded me a fresh perspective. It's a new vantage point. And I've actually rediscovered the center of my lane. And as we begin to travel again, and uh, notwithstanding yesterday's announcement, but in time, hopefully in July, when, when lockdown eases, what we all want to feel is safe. It's okay to try something different. Belonging, and that's engaged with work that fits, and knowing for sure that we are valued in our workplace, indeed loved. Because what I bring, what you bring, is wanted and needed. Each of us can help to inspire the level of inclusion in the workplace by having the courage and conviction to do these things. Encourage difference as a positive experience. Resist traditional norms. Study commensurate with the requirements of your role. Develop relevant skills and behaviors. Promote inclusion as an enriching reality challenge inappropriate behavior. Nurture the courage to live beyond any tick box and reward difference. 
You see, my three tips in summary are these. Meritocracy survives as a desire because of the romance around meritocracy. We want it to be so, don't we? Deep down, we want to know that the best person for the job has got the job. And yet there is evidence of so much around us that says something different. And so our heart cries out for meritocracy and it's no wonder we want it to be so. When our heart speaks to our head, it tells us that we gain validation when we land the job we've applied for, when we, when we, when we find and we realize that which we've aimed for. For any of us here who play golf, you know that time when you play a shot and it goes exactly where you've intended it to go? And you think, oh, why don't I take this up professionally? Indeed, some of you may be there already. But it goes for most endeavors. It goes for most activity. When things turn out just as you prepared it to, just as you planned it to, you think to yourself, yes, I've got it. And then the very next moment, the very next time, the very next day you try and do that, it falls short. Why does that happen? You see, validation often through our head is sometimes vested in others. And what I'm saying through this relatively short presentation is try not to have it invested in others. Know that you are worthy. Know that you're good enough is good enough. And finally, the third point about equity, about the economics of this present situation. Your hire will save the organization money. Your hire, your colorful talent is what's needed now as we ease out of lockdown more than ever before. And so as I begin and turn the final bend on my presentation and invite your questions, your comments, your reflections, let's have a good chat with Dennis as our host shortly. I want to wrap up by saying these few things. Finally, look after you. Spend quality time developing your self-awareness and acknowledging your own passions, your own values, your own beliefs. Nurture and trust your moral compass. It will help you navigate the journey ahead. Study, study hard, at least equal to your ambitions and always remain married. Yes, married to your potential. Let nobody put you apart. Never be separated from your potential. Never have that divorce visit you. You and your potential are one and no one should ever steal your joy in that. Manage your diet. We are biological entities. We are human beings. Exercise regularly and sleep well. Regulate what you watch discern what you read and be disciplined in your time spent on social media. Be careful and wary of those weapons of mass distraction. Know that your contributions are worthy. And I say again, let nobody, nobody steal your joy. Stay strong, stay safe and stay well. Keep it real as you offer your very best and welcome the best in those that you meet. Meritocracy is a myth. I've been around long enough to realize that myself, perhaps the hard way. What I offer today is a shortcut to that realization, understanding that our heart will forever yearn for it, but that by acknowledging it, that it is a myth, we can transcend it and still deliver our beautiful, colorful and glorious best. That is within our gift. Thank you for listening to me. I welcome your questions and I give over more of our time together for that interaction because I know what conferences can be like. People often want to share with their questions, comments and reflections. And so now I hand back to Dennis and invite those comments. Thank you again. 
Thank you, Rob, for your talk. Very insightful. And yeah, this is going to be a, a really good um, Q and A section. Um, let me bring the first question to the stage. Um, it's from Amalasa, and she has said, "How do you respond to a statement from a senior manager saying we based on recruitment and promotion on meritocracy?" Well, Amalasa, is that? Amalasa, I believe it is Amalasa. Amalasa, thank you very much for the question. It's a great question. And there's a premise to this question that certainly there's a query about whether or not meritocracy is being applied. Maybe there's some evidence of a particular type of person or people getting through into those positions around promotion. And I would start there, Omalosa. I would say, let's have a look at the empirical evidence. That's not to ignore the anecdotal. We'll come back to that in a minute. But let's look at the empirical evidence. I know, having been around uh, big uh, government departments and indeed some of the smaller ones too. I went from Ministry of Justice at 85,000 people to the Department for Education at six and a half thousand people. And I've also worked in smaller departments than that. And what they all have in common is their senior leadership teams, indeed their boards, their C-suite are of a particular type. They are of a particular type. You see, the decisions in those organizations, the strategic decisions being made, those big decisions in small rooms are made typically by men who come from a middle class background and are white in ethnicity. Now, don't get me twisted. Nothing wrong with that group of people. But where they are the only group of people making decisions for an entire organization that reflect the wonderful diversity of Britain in which we all live, there we begin to see a disconnect and a problem, a challenge that needs addressing. So I would say to any senior manager who makes this statement, why if we are applying meritocracy, do we not see a more reflective workforce at all levels of our organization? It begs the question, what else is going on to decide who gets into those small rooms where big decisions are made? Why is it that year on year, season on season, the same people are making decisions about me and you, Omolosa, and you, Dennis, and anyone else at this conference? Why don't I see me, why don't I see you, Omolosa, on that board in those promotion places? So I would say to the senior manager, I would sit down, I'd probably get the drinks in and I'd say, let's sit a while and look over the empirical evidence. Now, I did say at the very beginning of my answer, let's not forget the anecdotal evidence. The anecdotal evidence are in those stories of individuals in the organization. Those individual stories where we can collect the rich data of the lived experience of people in the organization. What stops someone applying for promotion? What makes people write themselves out of the race? What makes people fall over at the first hurdle? What makes people say, I wouldn't get on in that organization? The anecdotal stuff. You see, stories are data. They are critical data, often overlooked, but they are data with a soul. And in my experience, too many senior managers don't do well with soul. We have to bring the soul back into our analysis. And that, I think, is at the heart of your best response to that question. Thank you for that, Rob. Just quickly following on from before we go on to the next question, how, how, what are your thoughts on, obviously, we know that meritocracy is a myth and you want to talk to uh, the relevant powers that be, but how do you position yourself so that you're not seen as the black person bringing up black issues all of the time? While that's important, to some people that can actually be detrimental to your career. How have you managed to like, find that balancing act between the two and pushing the agenda and making sure it gets listened to, but not pushing it so much that people get bored of you and it negates your impact? And your yeah, impact. absolutely. Again, a, a wonderful, wonderful question, Dennis. And uh, let me start by, by confessing, uh, I've not always got that right. Uh, you know, many of my clearest lessons, my deepest lessons, my lessons that 
that blossom as revelation and therefore stay with me forever have come by getting things wrong. Yeah. The only thing worse than the wrong action is no action. And so I dust myself off and I go again. I, I'm never going to score the basket unless I shoot at the hoop. I've got to go for it. And so I have. And what I've learned over the years, Dennis, and what I would share with everyone at this conference is build your allies. I was once told by a senior civil servant, uh, one of the first black male civil servants 20 plus years ago. And he put it this way, language of the time. So forgive any insensitivities, folks. He said, Rob, don't own a dog and do all the barking yourself. I'm going to say that again. Don't own a dog and do all the barking yourself. What he was saying to me was build allies, posit in those allies the very message you would intend to deliver and have them deliver it. Because sometimes it's not about you taking the credit for what's being said, but it's about the message being delivered. And that takes a level of humility. And as I've already confessed, I did not get that right straight away. I didn't get it right second time. I had to learn the hard way, Dennis, that what's important is that the message gets through. Mm -hmm. And that message is sometimes better carried, more effectively carried by others. The most important thing is that the message is delivered. Great, thank you. Um, on to the next question, and this is from Winning. Rob, is it better to fight to be valued in the workplace or to seek out employers who value and respect your difference as a facet of their culture? Oh, what a fantastic, a fantastic question, Winnie. And I, I am bound to say to you, Winnie, it's not a cop out. I just want to say it this way. It does depend on the individual. Uh, I mentioned, didn't I, in my closing about looking after yourself. And sometimes you've got to you've got to give up the battle to win the war. Sometimes you've got to hone your discerning spirit and know what's worth fighting for and what's worth just letting it slip you by. And it's again, it's a tricky it's a tricky call sometimes. Uh, my view, you know, I'm I just turned 57 years old. And so I'm I'm closer to the end of my working life than I am the beginning of it, without doubt. And uh, whilst I love what I do and I've been revitalized in my latest role, I fully recognize that what I want to do more of now, Winnie, having served 37 plus years in the civil service, what I want to do now is spend my time working with organizations who really, truly want to be more inclusive. So I'm going to pick and choose now. I think I've earned that much. After three and a half decades, I think I deserve that much. I really do. And so by God's grace and with some wonderful people around me and on the team, I am going to work with F1. I am going to work with Nestle. I am going to work with organizations, housing corporations who look to offer affordable housing to people who otherwise wouldn't be able to afford it. I'm going to work with Relate because relationships really do matter. I'm going to channel my effort to organizations who really want to be more inclusive. That's what I'm doing. But I don't want my response to come over overly selfish. What I'm saying is, it's got to be where you're at. I know in, in my first two decades, I leaned in hard and worked at making, or at least trying to make, along with some wonderful people around me and on the team, to make the civil service more inclusive. We had some pockets of success. Civil service is a big machine. It's a massive thing. It's nearly half a million people. And so it was never going to be switched or flipped overnight. But we, we had some success along the way and there's still some seeds that were sown that will, 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 will bear fruit in time to come, perhaps long after I've uh, left this mortal coil. And I once heard it said, you know, Winnie, sometimes we've got to be prepared to plant a seed that will, that will grow a tree under which we will never sit. Sow and plant a tree under which you will never sit, because sometimes it's about those that will follow us. So make a decision. If you're up for it and you have the energy and the wherewithal, it's absolutely right that you seek to be valued in the workplace you find yourself. However, there will be occasions 
when having tried and offered your best, it's clear that that workplace is simply not ready for you. Move on. Find a workplace that will, because there you will soar. Thank you for that. We've got three. I know we're coming quickly to the end of the session, but I'll try and squeeze in a few more quick questions. Um, this one by Cornelius. How do you handle senior staff being seen as the heart of the worker, but in real life spend time on YouTube? Mm. Cornelius. Cornelius is getting right down to the ground truth of what really goes on. I'll try and be a, a bit shorter in my responses to kind of bring those more questions on, Dennis. So uh, if it helps, catch me on Twitter, folks, uh, at RobI46. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn if you want to catch me there too. Um, how do you handle senior staff being seen as the hard worker, but in real life spend time on YouTube? Um, I did mention, Cornelius, I walk in faith. And, you know, some of these issues are just not for us to be dealing with. We've got enough to get on with. And ultimately, if people are going to try and, you know, hoodwink and try and fool or um, bamboozle people, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in things will come their way. Um, I've got to keep my heart pure, my spirit free, and I've got to keep my eyes on the prize. Um, I can point it out to them one to one and say, look, you're saying this, but I can see you're doing this. Be true to yourself and get a hard day's work in uh, and be honest about your endeavor. I've done that before in my career and I've, I've had that work before. But ultimately, I don't spend a lot of time on it, to be honest with you. I just get on with my energy. I work with those that want to deliver their best. And as I said in my closing, offer the best in those that I meet. Uh, because otherwise, some of this stuff, Cornelius, can drag you down. And I'm not for dragging down. I'm for edifying and building up. And I think that's what we should spend our time on. Thank you, Rob. Um, the next question by Jasmine. Hi, Jasmine. Is not coming up, but I'll read it for you anyway. Yeah. What advice do you have for navigating your career when your experience is that the bar continues to be moved when it's your time? Again, it's a wonderful question. Now, is it Naomi, did you say? Jasmine. Jasmine. Yeah, Jasmine, thanks for the question. It's a, it's one of those questions that's rooted in the reality of it, isn't it? Um, because, you know, beyond the textbooks, beyond the conferences with presentations, the reality is that things keep moving. You try something, you, you think it's going to work, then it doesn't, and you get knocked back. Again, I speak from, you know, my experience. I don't spend a lot of time on it, uh, if I'm honest. Um, I just I just tend to, you know, move on, build my bounce ability, find and follow my passion and continue offering my uh, honest best. Um, and I do believe I do believe at the center of this is my my walk in faith that things will will work themselves through. Um, you know, I, 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 having said what I've said about meritocracy, I've said that to the wise to be to keep in mind that a lot of it is a romantic notion but in the main we put in the work we get the results um occasionally we don't but i'm not going to stay there i'm not going to remain in that place because um for me the outcome is 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 one that i'm not um looking for what i'm looking for is to keep my momentum moving to keep moving in the direction of my my aims and my purpose um my moral compass which is, you know, handcrafted by God and is, is guided in that way. And that's what I intend to carry on doing. So I don't spend a lot of time on it, to be honest. Um, if it's about making the organization aware that it needs to be consistent in what it's doing, absolutely get involved in that. But on a personal level, I just um, tend to uh, dust myself off and keep going. Right. The final question um, for this session, um, from my experience, and this is from Nelma. From my experience, in some workplaces, it seems as though HR departments are not there to protect employees in moments of crisis. Would you agree? And if so, where would you agree? Uh, where, where should young people, or even just general workers, where should they turn to? if they find themselves in a place of trouble at the workforce. Sure. sure. Well, who's, who's asked that Nelma. Nelma. N-E-L-M-A. 
Nelma, well, again, and all the questions have been absolutely fantastic. They're just rooted in the reality of what goes on in workplaces. So thank you, everyone, that posed the question. Um, I would say this. some I've worked in, oh, I don't know, maybe upward of nine or ten different government departments, uh, albeit for some short period of time. But I've also had a spell outside of government on a uh, secondment, a loan period, to the voluntary sector and then came back in. So I've got a fair amount of experience in my in my years. And what I've discovered is that some HR functions, some HR functions fall short of what they're there to do. They're made up of people, human beings, and for whatever combination of reasons, I've known it where they've actually fallen short, significantly fallen short and, and really made some devastating errors. I've, I've supported individuals that have ended up being dismissed unjustifiably and on a couple of occasions had them reinstated and the trauma they went through. I've, I've worked with, with, with HR functions who just don't understand the sensitivity of given situations. Now, I have to say that has been my minority experience. Most of the time, HR functions, almost by definition, are made up of well-meaning, hardworking, really industrious individuals who want to support people in that organization. They're almost called to working in HR. And that's my majority experience. But if you are finding yourself in a situation that you're falling short, if your HR function is not delivering what needs to be done, I would suggest that you either turn to the existing staff networks in that organization or create one. Create one. The networks in organization made up of people, what I call intrinsic owners of the issues, whether we're talking about LGBT, whether we're talking about disability or whether we are talking about race and black staff networks. When those people come together to meet the needs of their members and make the organization a better place, they are often ahead of the curve on any HR function. When they work with HR, oh, my goodness, then you do take off. But even separate to HR, not instead of, but separate to, those networks are critical business entities. And if, if supported by progressive leadership, Nelma, what those staff networks can do is they can actually make the organization a better and more inclusive place. Just think about it. Increase in employee engagement reduction in sick absence, less stress, less grievance claims, more applications from their members for jobs that they otherwise might be told that they're not good enough for. But you build the morale, you build the spirit. Staff networks give you a place to heal when you've bumped into the ism of your existence. In the case of black staff, we're talking about racism in the workplace. They give you a place where you can, an A&E, that you can receive treatment, you can receive a listening ear. And then with your spirit rebuilt, you can come again, apply for that job that you were told you were never good enough for. But you always were. You always were good enough. But you, you, the gaslighting, the microaggressions every day made you feel as though you were less than. You were not capable. You were. You are more than worthy. And by applying, because you've come through the A&E of your staff network. The HR functions let you down. Your senior managers have let you down. But your staff network has listened to you, have heard you, Ubuntu, and they've had you come again at what needs to be done. That way, you offer your best yet again and you realize your potential. You maximize your potential. What you need around those staff networks are champions, allies who can ensure that the network gets invested in to deliver a better organization. That's the magic that can occur in organizations. Rob, thank you so much for your time, your insights and your answers. Looking through the chats, I, I can see people are very much like inspired by what you said today and Thanks giving us great advice. Um, what we're going to do now is go on to a quick break. I know our session is due to start in about five minutes or so. Um, Rob, quickly before you go, how can people connect with you if they want to sure. know? Sure. Well, let, let's start by saying thank you, everyone, for listening to the session. I hope it landed in a good place, in an edifying place. I want to thank you, Dennis, and Roshan, 
for all that you've done in putting this together and any other members of your team. Success Talks, accelerate your career. Uh, anyone who wants to connect with me can do on LinkedIn. It's Rob Neal, N-E-I-L. And if not on LinkedIn, if that's not your thing, I mean, if it's by choice, then fair enough. If you're not on LinkedIn and you've just been lazy, get on LinkedIn. It's a beautiful platform for professionals who are moving forward and up. But if not on LinkedIn, try me on Twitter. That's at Robby, R-O-B-Y-E 46. And one other point, if I may, Dennis, um, I, along with my dear friend, Paul, we have a weekly radio show. Um, it's called Unfinished Business. You can get it on Spotify, Unfinished Business with Paul and Rob. Check us out. A bit of fun, a bit of play, wrapped in some music. But yes, discussing issues similar to this one about offering our best in our communities. At UB Harrow Radio, at UB Harrow Radio, available on Twitter and indeed on Instagram. Thank you for having me. Stay well, stay safe, and God bless you all.